Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, I wanna quickly talk to you about how the virus that causes COVID-19 affects our body. First thing is COVID-19 is actually the name of the disease caused by the virus known as SARS-CoV-2. Now the virus, like many other viruses, looks a little bit like this. It has a membrane and inside of that membrane, it has single-stranded RNA. Now RNA is similar to DNA. It's actually a more readable version of DNA. And what this virus wants to do is replicate itself. Now the thing is you can see on the outside of the virus there's all these things sticking out. Now these are proteins and sugars that the virus has and the ones here in red are what we call S proteins. Now the S proteins are basically the key. When we inhale this virus, so the virus can be transmitted through respiratory droplets. So directly through coughing, sneezing or also what we call fecal oral route which is if for example fecal material that has the virus in it ultimately goes into our mouth, it can go down into the digestive system and have various effects there, which I'll talk about shortly. These S proteins are a key that needs to lock into a protein in the body in order for the virus to get into the cell to have its effect. So let's just say there are these uh, SARS-CoV viral particles floating around in the atmosphere and we inhale them. Okay, what I've drawn up here is an alveoli. Now, alveoli are the basically the air sacs within our lungs. So remember, if you were to inhale something, it goes into your oral cavity, down your trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and then ultimately we get to the alveoli. And the whole purpose of the alveoli is for gases to exchange with the blood and back and forth. So we want oxygen to come in, and we want oxygen to go from inside the alveoli into the blood, so the blood can then distribute it around the body. And we want carbon dioxide that's been produced from the cells in our body to then exchange into the alveoli to be breathed out again. So gas exchange is its primary function. Now, the thing is there's three major cell types you need to know within an alveoli. These cell types are called alveolar type one, alveolar type two, and macrophages. Now sometimes they're called pneumocytes, type one pneumocytes, type two pneumocytes, or type one, type two alveolar cells. So for example, the type one cell is there for gas exchange. And what these cells are, are simple squamous epithelia. That means they're these individual, there's a single layer of squish looking epithelial cells. They're simply there for that gas exchange to occur. That's all that they do. The second type of cell, the type two cell, which are these cuboidal looking cells, they actually produce something called surfactant. Now what surfactant does is it's like a detergent. Now I want you to think about this. When you take a breath in, okay, now what happens is by the time that air that you inspire gets down to the alveoli, it's cleaned, it's humidified, and it's warmed. All right, to 37 degrees. So you've got this clean, warm 37 degree air here that has a lot of water molecules dispersed throughout it. So there is water inside your alveoli. And here's the thing, water on the micro scale is really sticky. And if you've got a fine layer of water around your alveoli, it's really sticky and wants to stick to each other. Have you ever poured a glass of water and you've hit that meniscus where the water actually goes higher than the lip of the glass? The reason why that happens is because water likes to stick to water. The reason why 20 meter or 20 foot trees can get water all the way up to the leaves is because of something called capillary action where water sticks to water and pulls up, 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 up that tree. Water is sticky, that's my take home point. And that means that when you take a breath in, the alveoli expand, when you breathe out, the walls are coming closer together and if there's water on those walls, the alveoli will come together and collapse. That is not something we want. So these type two pneumocytes or type two alveoli cells produce surfactant, it's detergent. It breaks the surface tension of that water, which means you can inhale and exhale and the water is no longer sticky. Great. The third type of cell are these ones here and they're called macrophages. Now macrophages, macro means large, phage means eat. They're big eaters and so these are immune cells. The thing is usually we shouldn't have any bacterial viruses coming down into our alveoli because we've got mucus and cilia that usually captures particles on the way down so it cleans it out. 
However, if we do get bacteria and viruses coming down into our alveoli and infecting the tissue here, this is called pneumonia, either bacterial or viral pneumonia. Now with COVID-19, what can happen is this virus can come down and remember the virus has single stranded RNA inside and it's got those S proteins on the outside. These S proteins, like I said, are the key. If it ends up getting down into the um, alveoli, what happens is you'll find that these type two alveolar cells, the ones that produce surfactant, they actually have a protein on their surface. And this protein is the lock. And so if we get it coming through, the S proteins will bind to this lock. And what this lock is called is ACE. The name of this lock is ACE. Let's write it down here. In actual fact, it's called ACE2, and that stands for angiotensin converting enzyme two. Now you may have heard of it previously. You may have heard of ACE before. What ACE does is it converts angiotensin into angiotensin two. It converts angiotensin one into angiotensin 2. And what angiotensin 2 does in the body is it increases blood pressure. It does it one way by constricting certain blood vessels. But what ACE2 does, so that's what ACE1 does, what ACE2 does is it turns angiotensin 2 into something called angiotensin 1 to 7. Now what angiotensin 1 to 7 does is the opposite. It drops blood pressure. And it can do this by relaxing blood vessels. But what it also is, is it's anti-inflammatory. It's anti-inflammatory, which is important. So ACE2 is present to help reduce blood pressure and it has anti-inflammatory properties. This is gonna be important in a sec. When this virus, lock and key S protein into ACE2 receptor. The virus is now taken in to the cell. Now, once that virus is in the cell, let's have a look. Let's see what happens. Once the virus gets into that type two pneumocyte or type two alveolar cell, it needs to replicate and assemble. So we've got this cuboidal type two cell. The virus, when it comes in, it fuses with the membrane of this cell and it releases its components. So it fuses with the membrane of this cell and it releases that single-stranded RNA. Now, some when we look at DNA and RNA, it's got what we call a five prime and three prime end. This is just different ways you can read it. You can read it this way. It's like reading a book from front to back or back to front, okay? Now, what happens is when the single-stranded RNA from the virus is in this cell, it hijacks our transcriptional machinery and, for example, ribosomes, it will read this five prime to three prime and what it spits out is a protein. In actual fact, it spits out two big polypeptide proteins. And what these polypeptide proteins do is they can then read this single-stranded RNA, three prime to five prime, amazingly, and produce a whole bunch of assembly proteins. So it can produce these S proteins, other surface proteins and sugars, and the membrane as well. And so what ends up happening is it produces, like I said, S proteins, other surface proteins and sugars, and also various aspects of the membrane. Then what it can do is reassemble, take some of that S SSRNA, single-stranded RNA, reassemble it and spit it out of the cell, which means it starts to release from these cells. And what we end up having are millions and millions of these viral particles now being released into the alveoli. And this leads to irritation. This irritation can lead to coughing, for example, and coughing can then expel these viruses out into the atmosphere in respiratory droplets and facilitate further spread. But now remember I said to you that if you have an infection in your lung parenchyma or tissue like this, it is pneumonia. Well, what can happen is when these cells start to release all the viruses, they're not happy. These cells are damaged. Sometimes the cells can burst. And when cells burst, 
they release a whole bunch of chemicals, pro-inflammatory chemicals. So when this happens, expect to get huge amounts of pro-inflammatory chemicals. Now, important ones that we need to know are cytokines. And examples of cytokines include the interleukins and the tumor necrosis factors. Now, don't worry about the specifics at the moment. What these pro-inflammatory cytokines do is a couple of things. It, because it's inflammation, you have redness, you have pain, you have swelling, you have all this type of stuff. One of the things that happens is the blood that goes past these alveoli, cytokines tell it to do two things. It tells it to put a whole bunch of holes in it, so it becomes more permeable or porous, which means the blood that comes past starts to leak out. Now, it's not really the blood that's leaking out, it's the fluid of the blood called plasma that leaks out. And so it leaks out between the blood vessel and the alveoli, but also goes into this tissue itself, into the alveoli, which now means that instead of oxygen and carbon dioxide crossing this very thin barrier, a barrier that's usually 10 times thinner than a piece of paper, it's now thicker and it's harder for gas to go back and forth because there's now fluid here. And this fluid is stopping this gas exchange. Now this can be acute respiratory distress syndrome and this is very, very bad, okay? This is when individuals may need to go on ventilators, for example. Now the other thing is that in addition to making this permeable, the blood vessel gets wider and more blood comes in which makes it worse and worse and worse. Now, this is localized inflammation, but if this gets bad enough, these inflammatory chemicals can jump into the bloodstream and go to the whole body and this results in systemic inflammation. And this systemic inflammation could result in septic syndrome, which means you now have inflammation around the entire body. And this inflammation around the entire body is gonna result in these types of issues. So tissues won't be fed properly. Organs will go into failure. This is a bad thing, obviously. Now, another thing is that when this all happens, you have white blood cells coming in at the same time, like neutrophils. And neutrophils can lead to pus being formed and again, thickening this barrier, making it harder for gas to exchange. Because these cells here, these type two cells that pulled in the virus and then released the virus, because they make surfactant, if they're dying off, you also have less surfactant, which means these alveoli are more likely to collapse as well. So you've got collapsing alveoli, alveoli that's uh, not exchanging gas very efficiently. You've got fluid building up in these alveoli as well. You've got inflammation happening in this area. And then when you start calling in immune responses, over time it can lead to fibrosis. So fibroblasts, which are certain cells that come in to try and repair epithelia, result in basically scar tissue that's forming in the lungs and it makes the lungs hard. If the lungs become harder, obviously that's more difficult for gas exchange to occur. So the other thing is once you've got all these cytokines in the bloodstream, they're gonna to go to the brain as well, specifically an area of the brain called the hypothalamus, which regulates temperature, right? Body temperature. Usually it's set at about 37 degrees Celsius, but these cytokines can bump it up. It can bump it to 38, 39, 40 degrees, and that means the body now has a new set temperature and the body temperature goes up. It's doing this to try and deal with the pathogen that's invading in the body. Now, is fever a good or bad thing? That's very difficult to work through because some um, evidence demonstrates that fever helps boost the immune system to try and fight this off, but also if a fever goes unchecked, it can result in an individual going downhill very quick. So it's a fine line between whether a fever is good or bad. So we've got the cough, we've got the pneumonia, and we've got the fever, and also we've got the acute respiratory distress syndrome that can occur if it's left unchecked. So hopefully that helps.